I just mute Sarah Lee's this is home life there. Um, I mean, not that we're bothered, of course, but you know, just for his sake. Um, right, so I'm going to wait for a few more people to arrive, even though it's um, four o'clock. Um, so I'm just going to wait until two minutes past four because we're a slightly smaller group than we have been previously. Okay, so welcome everybody. Uh, I'm going to wait just one more minute in case anybody else comes. Okay, so if anybody else today, um, the plan is um, to try and do question two together um, and also then to move on to question five and question six. 
Um, I think there's way too much material for us to cover absolutely everything in this one um, 45 minute session. Um, we're going to do something similar to we did last time. So there's going to be some gaps for you to try and calculate things. Um, now, I haven't checked whether or not Sarah Lee has released the solutions. Um, so, you know, please do just play along if he already has and, um, you know, see if you can calculate again um, and see that you're happy with, um, you know, the method for each of the questions. So, um, let's go one more person to let in and then we'll switch over to the visualizer and get cracking with question two. So, as before, um, if you've got any questions, even if it's just like your visualizer is really out of focus um, or something like that, please do put those in the chat. Um, remember that you can message each other in the chat as well. So if you've got a friend in the class and you're like, she's talking a load of rubbish, Phil, please feel free to um, chat directly with any of your classmates via the chat function about what's going on. Um, can be a great opportunity to sort of, you know, get some feedback from somebody else in the class. I realise you've probably never all met in real life, which is all a bit tricky, but never mind. Okay, so yeah, just interrupt me um, if I'm going too fast, if you don't figure, if you can't figure out what we're doing, if you're just like, oh, this is baffling, uh, you know. Um, otherwise, I will fairly much just assume that we're fine, but we'll see, we'll see. Okay. All right, so this looks like it's nicely in focus. That's good. Move my computer over a little bit, so I'm move my paper over. So question two, and the first part of question two we were asked to do um, was we were given an ordered um, sample set um, with twenty data points, um, and. We were asked to give uh, the five number summary of this data. And Sara Lees has been so kind as to order the data from the smallest to the largest for us. Um, if you receive data in a question in the exam, which is not ordered, of course, you're going to have to try and put them in the right order. So order them from the smallest to the largest uh, first. Um, so where do we start with this? We've been asked for. Um, uh, this five point summary and um, what we need, uh, the five data points we need to give um, are the maximum, um, the minimum, um, the, uh, the 0 0.5 quartile uh, of the data. Um, so the Q there has a little hat on because it's a property of the data rather than the property of the distribution. Um, and we are also are um, we also need to give the twenty uh, fifth percentile um, and the seventy fifth percentile. Now, when we're asked to give the fiftieth percentile, that's the same as the median. Um, and you'll, um, if you've looked at the exercise sheet, um, you, you get to prove that that is the median in the final question in question seven. Okay, so so looking at my data. Um, some of these are easier than others. So um, finding the minimum, yeah, that's easy. That's just the first number um, in the table of data because it's ordered. Um, so hopefully the minimum you can just immediately read off. Uh, it's 29.140. Um, and then um, oh. I think maybe I'd like to put them the other way around so that I go from... Um, from the smallest to the biggest or the biggest to the smallest in the summary statistics. So I'd like to um, try the 25th percentile myself next. Now, the first thing I want to do if I want to calculate a 25th percentile is I need to look at um, what the R is for that value. So I calculate R using uh, this formula. So I say R equals P times um, N, N plus 1. And I've got a really good question on Thursday morning, so on Tuesday morning, which was, why do we have to add on one? Um, and it's easier to see in the case when we're talking about the median, because we've got 20 data points at the moment, n is equal to 20. Um, in order to find the median um, one, we don't want that to be the 10th value. Um, 
if we didn't add on the one, uh, we just divided the number of items in the sample by, five, uh, um, by two, um, we'd get the tenth element um, in, um, in the sample. But for the median, we need um, actually um, a, a weighted average of the tenth and the eleventh. So in order to center the, you know, center the median in the right place, we need to add on that extra one. Um, so that's an intuitive reason why we're adding on that extra one when we calculate R. So um, to do the 25th percentile, I've got P is equal to 0 0.25 because that's the P, that's the percentile I'm looking for. And um, I'm going to need to multiply by 21 because uh, I've got 20 points in my sample and I need to add on one. Um, so this leaves me with um, uh, R is equal to 5.25. 5.25. Now I was given a formula um, for the quartiles um, and the formula I was given um, was that I need to take the integer part of this which would be five um, so I need the fifth element so when I put the little round brackets that means it's the fifth element in the ordered sample um, so the fifth biggest um, so fifth smallest in this case. Um, and then um, I need the non-integer part of, of, of this. So uh, the 0 0.25. And I need to take a, um, apply that to the difference between the next point along. So x6 minus x5. Okay, I'll just put somebody else to that in. Okay. Now, if I look up those two data points um, in the information, so just by counting along, um, I'm going to get uh, uh, 36.571 um, and then 0 0.25 um, 38.417 minus 36.571. And my final answer should be 47.0325. Now, in this particular case, when I've calculated the 25th percentile of this particular data with 20 points, um, I've ended up putting 0 0.25 here. And you need to just be a bit careful that I haven't put 0 0.25 there because P is equal to 0 0.25. I put that there because um, it's the the difference between R and the integer part of R. So um, it, it could have been a different number if I'd had a, a sample of a different size. So now that you've seen, um, you know, the formula in practice for how to calculate the 25th percentile, um, I would just like to ask you just to take a minute, um, just check what you've done already if you've already worked on this question um, or take a look at the question and calculate for yourself um, what the values of um, the 50th percentile of the data is and what the 75th percentile of the data is using the same formula. So see if you can fill those out as well. Um, um, calculate those in a similar way um, and um, basically finish off our, um, our five point summary there. Um, so you should write out the max, find the other two required um, percentiles, and I'll just copy on this one that we've found here.
So I really hope that you've been able to give that a little bit of a go. Um, don't worry if uh, you've not been quick enough to do both of them if you didn't look at the sheet in advance. Um, you know, it, it certainly takes some time to get your calculator and look through the list of numbers and find the right numbers to be doing with. Um, but this one, the 75th percentile is um, 44.01975. Um, so you're all, you should be almost there um, with part A. Uh, in part B, we were asked to find the sample mean um, X bar. And we were also use, asked to find the sample standard deviation. Yes. And um, we just use exactly the same formula as we've used in previous weeks. So for the sample mean, I need to just add up all of the elements in my sample and divide by the number that there are there. So one over 20, and then I need to sum up over the elements in the sample. And it's not a quick thing to be doing, right? Especially when Sarah Lees has asked us to, you know, only use our calculator. Uh, you know, for this week's exercises. So, you know, you need to be careful. And, um, um, you know, if you're anything like me, I'm really clumsy with a calculator. You probably want to do it like, like two or three times just to be on the safe side that you've not messed something up or missed a number out. Um, it's totally fine to feel that way about numbers, definitely. Um, so the number that you should get, and I checked it with the computer, so I know that it's okay, um, is um, 40.6942. Okay, and with the sample standard deviation, that's a bit more complicated. So I started off by calculating the variance, and the formula I used for the variance was the um, unbiased estimator um, of the variance. So I divide by 1 minus n, so 19 in this case. Um, because I'm dealing with um, the actual sample rather than uh, you know, the full distribution. I want, I want to make sure that um, the, the, the sample variance is an unbiased estimator for the um, variance of the underlying distribution. Um, and the formula I'm gonna use is um, the one where the um, square has been multiplied out because it just means that I can reuse my answer to the mean. Um, so I wanna do one minus N. Um, so um, i is equal to 1 up to 20, and then those xi's, each of them individually squared, um, take off 20 times x bar. And just using that form uh, rather than the one with um, x min xi minus um, x bar in the brackets, um, all squared, um, is it's, it's just easier to handle if you're like me and you don't like your calculator. Um, so hopefully you got, um, um, you used that form and you got an actual number out in the end. So moving on to the third part. Um, we needed to draw a histogram. And the first thing with drawing a histogram, oh, sorry, we've got somebody waiting. Okay. So sorry to anybody who I've left hanging out in the, um, in the waiting room unnecessarily. I was obviously, well, not noticing, acting dim. Okay, so going back to uh, part C, um, you know, when we're drawing a histogram, the first thing I wanna do is to draw a table. And I wanna specify what the intervals are over which I am gonna be recording the data, um, which should all be the same width. Um, record the number of items in my data set that fall into that particular interval, and then um, to rescale so that the area under the histogram overall is going to be one. So in this case, um, I split down um, my data into um, intervals of width five, um, and those intervals are um, 25 to 30, uh, 30 to 35, etc. Okay, so um, what I've done here is I've left the intervals so that they're not overlapping. 
Um, and I've done that by making sure that they're all open on the same side. So they're all open on the left and closed on the right so that they're non-overlapping. So if I get a data point that is exactly 30, 35, that needs to go in this one, not in this one, because this interval contains the number 25 because it's got the um, closed bracket um, on the side that says 35, whereas this one doesn't contain 35, but it does contain 35.00001, for example. So I just need to make sure they're not overlapping and just be careful about where any values that are really close to the end actually go. Um, and then I need to look at my um, sample again and then count up how many elements are in each of these intervals. So the first column, the, the next column I wanna write on is gonna be the frequency of the data. Now this can be really handy even if you've got um, a non-ordered um, sample because you can actually uh, just put a tally in there which will help you um, calculate you know, how many entries are in that data um, in, in that interval without having to reorder the data. But in our case, it's lovely. So our release has been very kindly kind and ordered the data for us. Um, so we can just look along each, each row um, and count up how many are in each interval. So for the first couple of intervals, I've got one element between 25 and 30 and two elements uh, between 30 and 35 and um, we'd say five in total uh, between 35 and 40. And I'll leave you guys to fill out um, the rest of that. Now I can check I've not missed anything just by adding them all up. Um, so if I add up the entries in this frequency column, I should get to 20, which is exactly the number of um, elements in the sample that Sarah gave, gave me. So I can be sure that nothing went wrong. I didn't miss one um, when I was counting those. Um, so the next question is how tall do I want the bars in the histogram to be? So what do I want the density to be um, recorded as? And what I would like with, for my histogram is I'd like the area under that to be equal to one. So I know that each of the bars is going to be five across. I can see that immediately. That's how I've constructed it. So because the bars need to be five across, if I had them as going up one for each entry, um, uh, for each data point, I'm going to have five times 20 um, as the area underneath. I'm going to have... Um, 100 as the, um, as the area underneath. So I need to rescale so that when I add up um, everything in that frequency column, I get to one. Um, so, um, so my next column is height of the density histogram. So this is the rescaled information. I'm gonna have one over 100 and two over 100 and five over 100. Etc. And my reasoning is is the um, n times the width of the column is twenty times five, which is a hundred, which is why I'm dividing by a hundred here. Okay. So. Using that information, I'm, I'm right away. Um, now, because my handwriting is not great when I'm presenting um, on an um, overhead projector like this, I'm just going to put on my histogram so you can see roughly what I managed to do there. So you can see that my, first of all, you can see my handwriting is much more neat. And I've got my squared papers so you can immediately see um, that We've got one three between 25 and 30, so my bar goes up one. I've rescaled by 100 to make sure that the area underneath is uh, one overall and each of um, the other columns as well. Now, what we've been asked um, in the next part, in part D, um, was to look at whether we thought this information was symmetric or not. And there's three possible things we could kind of look at. Um, we could look at um, whether um, the distance between the median of the data in the 25th percentile is comparable to the difference between uh, the 75th percentile and the median of the data. So um, 
if, if the data is symmetric, we'd expect um, that that difference is similar. So Q um, 0 0.75 minus um, Q has 0 0.5. We'd expect that to be approximately the same as the, di the difference between the um, quartiles on the other side. We'd also expect um, the median of the data, so 50th percentile, to be roughly the same as the mean. Um, so why is that intuitively? So um, if the median was significantly bigger or smaller um, than the mean, then we're going to be expecting there to be a cluster of data um, on one side of the mean and then a long tail on the other, which would kind of like uh, so, um, uh, on the other side of the median, which would pull the um, mean value upwards. Um, and the third thing we can look at is the shape um, of the histogram of the histogram. And sometimes that's really, really obvious. So um, if I looked at my histogram and I had like lots of data in the very smallest column um, and then just tapering off, I'd be imme immediately able to see like that is not going to be a symmetric set of data. Um, whereas in this case, I'd say it's a little tiny bit more difficult because if I look at um, my histogram again, you know, I might be tempted to say, oh, it's relatively symmetric because, um, you know, that it's got the biggest bar in the middle. And, you know, I, I think that would be a fair thing to say as well. But it might also be tempting to say, oh, but there's a little tiny bit more data on this side. Um, so it's not. And um, I, I think that really does depend on where you center the bars of width five. So uh, there is a lot of data very close to 40 here, which is one of the things that make, makes you, when you look at that, say, oh no, there's quite a lot in the tail this side. Um, so it can be, a, you know, you wanna look at the shape as well as some of the summary statistics in these cases where it's like quite close, um, you know, you wanna try and make a judgment there. Okay, so again, I wanna offer you an opportunity to actually work on something now. So um, before we get on to question number five, which is very similar and we kind of work through and um, generate ourselves a box and whisker plot, um, just live because I know that you've not done this. Could you possibly um, draw a box and whisker plot for this data um, for question two, using the question two data? Um, and I'm going to give you maybe five minutes to try and do that. So as a prompt as to where to start, um, make sure you first of all calculate the interquartile range. Use your interquartile range to calculate the thresholds for the outliers. Find out whether there's any outliers in this data um, and what the upper and lower adjacents are and try and put all of that information on a box and whisker plot for me. Um, so we'll have, I, I reckon, five minutes. So until 32 minutes past four um, for you to give that a go. Again, maybe you won't get through doing all of it. Um, maybe you'll do it quicker than five minutes, but, you know, just give it a try. Um, and then we'll have a little chat about it before going on to question five. Okay, so Joe's asked me to go back to the summary statistics and um, we're going to do it again in question five because the first part of question five asked us for the summary statistics again. So don't worry about that. We're going to see it as soon as we get on to um, uh, question five. We're going to go through the theory of it again. There they are. I've not put all of them on. I've put on the 75th, the 25th and the minimum.
Okay, so don't worry if you've not finished. Um, I'll just give you a little rough sketch of what I hope you were trying to do. So uh, the first thing we want is an estimate for the interquartile range, uh, which is the difference between um, the 75th percentile and the 25th percentile. Um, and then you use this uh, to calculate thresholds for the outliers, uh, which are um, the 25th percentile of the sample minus 1.5 times the interquartile range, um, which in this case is 26.55. Uh, um, and similarly, um, for the upper bound, um, you just need to switch the negative to a positive one. Now, looking at the max and the min in the summary statistics, I can immediately see that all of the data is going to be inside this range. Um, so that gives me the low, lower adjacent is equal to. Uh, the minimum data point in this case and the upper adjacent um, equal to the maximum data point in this case. And um, again, I'm going to show you my diagram rather than draw it out. One for ease and, and two because I can draw slightly better um, when I'm not under time pressure. So what have we got there? Um, we've got the um, um, lower adjacent um, at the end of the whisker, um, the upper adjacent at the end of the whisker, and then the interquartile range in the box with a solid line through there at the median. Um, so that's going to be handy um, when we come to look at question number five, because that's exactly what we've been asked to do in question five. So I hope um, with that from... Uh, from question two, you would be finding um, at least some parts of, of question five nice and easy. Um, so I want us to um, potentially just focus on um, um, part one and part two. So with question one, uh, question five, part one and, and part two, we've been asked to look at. So um, Louise has asked me, um, do we need to draw the little lines um, indicating where the end of the whiskers are? Because I've put little lines on. I realize I, I do that. Um, it's maybe a little particular quirk of mine because there aren't little lines like that um, on the diagrams that come out um, when you do a box plot in R. So you don't need the little vertical here uh, necessarily. It's just where this line here ends, okay? So, um, yeah. Um, extra ones for the limit of the outliers. Um, no, we don't. We just need to, um, you know, for anything that's outside the lower adjacent and the upper adjacent, we just need to mark that on as a little empty circle um, because um, at any points outside that range are going to be um, um, outliers. Um, yeah. Okay, great stuff. So we get a little bit of a, of a practice with that. Um, with parts A and parts B on question five. Um, so you should be able to do that now that we've had a chat about question two. Um, so I'm not gonna leave you very long for that because I assume that you've taken a look at the exercise sheet in advance. So if what you could do is just look over what you did um, for question A and B of question five, if you got a chance to look at that um, in light of what we've just said and just see if there's any little corrections or updates you wanna make or if you're really confident with this material. Um, and 
uh, if you haven't had a chance, because there's a lot on this exercise sheet, just give it a bit of a crack now. Um, I realise that you might not get to the end of it in the time that I'm going to allow. Um, so what I'd like to do is I'd like to give you just like three or four minutes, which is then going to leave me um, a min five minutes uh, to talk about question six, because I think question six and its relationship to question five are quite interesting. So um, question five, part A and B, just a couple of minutes just to review your answers, uh, just to check that you were going in the right direction or to give this exercise a crack if you've not had a chance. Okay, so I hope that you've had a chance um, to look at that. And I really hope that you actually had a solid crack in advance. Um, but what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna show you uh, what my box and whisker plot looked like for that question. And we'll have a little chat about it. So the diagram I drew was this one here. Um, so- Yeah, I we go again. You can't see it so well on my dotted paper, but I've got two outliers there. I've got the two smallest points marked with little circles because they're outliers. Um, and um, the lower whisker of the box and whisker plot is at 63. Now the um, lower bound for the outliers that I calculated was actually 43.5. Um, so you might have made a mistake in extending this tail out to 43.5, but you want to look for the smallest data point, which is bigger than that lower bound, and then just leave the whisker at, at that point. And then roughly speaking, I've got um, the 25th and the 75th percentile there. I think maybe my ruler wasn't really kind of up for given us exact levels there um, and uh, the median of, uh, of 78 um, in the middle of the box there. And at the top end, again, actually something strange happened. So when I calculated the upper bound for the outliers on the top of the range, I actually got a number which was more than 100. So it was completely impossible in terms of the outcome of these tests. So, um, but that doesn't mean that, again, that doesn't mean that I extend my whisker past the range of possible outcomes. I just look for the biggest element of the sample that's, uh, that actually exists uh, and, and limit myself to that point there. Okay. All right. So hopefully you'll forgive me for um, 
who are maybe laboring, laboring this point. Um, now, question six, I quite liked because question six, I was asked to um, calculate the um, uh, interquartile range for the normal distribution and then compare this with the interquartile range for this data to see if um, I thought the data was likely to be normal or not. Um, and um, I just want to maybe give a little bit of a hint as to what's going on. So the uh, cum cumulative density function um, for X, um, if it's normally distributed with parameters um, mu and sigma squared, um, I have a capital F of X, and this is equal to this function. Um, and I need to normalize n in here, so I need to subtract off the mean and divide by the um, standard deviation. Um, so deriving that was what I needed to do in the first part. And um, then in the second part, um, I needed to um, use the inverse function. Um, so I needed to look at um, the fact that this was the case for the pth quartile. So if Q, if Q is equal to um, QP, then I should have, um, uh, sorry, Q minus mu divided by sigma um, equals P. Um, and I could rearrange this um, to make Q the subject. Um, which then left us with the form that was required. So QP equals um, mu plus sigma, and then the inverse function um, of psi uh, of P. Now I can look this value up um, in the table, um, and that was how um, I was able to get uh, the interquartile range um, for the normal distribution. Um, as the difference between the 75th quartile, 75th percentile rather, and the 25th percentile, um, using this formula um, and looking up those inverses in the table, I ended up with 1.349 sigma. Um, and if I compare that with um, the, um, uh, with the, standard deviation of the sample in question, um, I get an estimate for this um, uh, interquartile range in the case of um, a normal assumption, um, which is really radically different from the actual um, observed interquartile range, giving me the idea that it's definitely not normal. Um, so I feel like I possibly accelerated um, a little bit unnecessarily at the end there, but it might be something that you know that you want to look at the solutions in a little bit more detail. Um, and then if you've got any questions, um, you know, come back either to me or to Sarah Lee's about um, because I do think that this particular question um, is is really interesting and um, you know something that you know you should is it, definitely achievable is is um, but is a little bit non-trivial compared with some of the other questions on the exercise sheet. Okay, so I'm going to wind up now. I realise that in previous weeks I've overrun a little bit, um, but I'm going to wind up because I've got a repeat of this class at five. Um, and yeah, we need to kind of get ready for that. So feel free to hang around and ask questions in the chat if you need to. Um, and I'll get on those for the next 15 minutes. But otherwise, please feel free to leave and I'll see you in a fortnight.
Well, thank you, everybody. Yeah. I just realized that I've got like strange things going on. That's a bit better. A bit less distracted by the rubbish behind me.
Hello, so welcome to everybody who's early. Uh, we're going to wait at least until five, maybe until two minutes past five before we start. Um, I'm here and I'm going to be paying attention before then. Um, I am going to put myself on mute, however, so that you don't have to listen to my household noises. Um, but if you want to ask anything or you've got anywhere, any recommendations as to which question to start on or anything like that, please feel free to chat to me or each other in the chat as well, just as soon as you arrive. Um, and I'll come back to you all um, in five minutes.
Okay, so just again, for anybody who's just joined us in the last couple of minutes, um, welcome. Thank you very much for being early. Uh, this is Introduction to Statistics um, exercise sheet four. Um, we're going to start in probably about three or four minutes um, just to give other people a chance to arrive. Uh, feel free to chat to each other or me or anything really in that interim time. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to leave you off mute this time, um, but there might be some household noises in the background. Yeah, we'll just... We've got a whole bunch of extra people, so welcome. As mentioned literally a couple of minutes ago, we're going to wait another couple of minutes just to see who else turns up. And then get cracking. So I'm going to go by computer time, not by the time on the clock behind me. I think I possibly set that to avoid missing any trains. It's not right. It's one minute past five. Okay, so I think we're going to crack on um, this. Oh, we've got one more person. <laughs> Confusing. Um, it's introduction to statistics. Uh, we don't have any crazy questions about cats and dogs at the beginning of this session. Um, we're also not going to be using poll anywhere, but we'll come back to that in a couple of weeks' time. Um, so it is exercise sheet four. Most of this was about um, summary statistics um, and about drawing histograms and um, box and whisker plots. And that's exactly what we're going to be doing today. So there's a lot of questions on this sheet. And there, uh, if, if you were here a fortnight ago, you know that I'm definitely not going to get anywhere close to, through all seven questions on the sheet. So what's the plan? So the plan is, is we're going to do question two together um, and uh, we're going to do a little extra bit on question two so that you've definitely got something to work on. Um, and then having seen that, we're going to check that the answers that we got to question five are right. And then time permitting, which I really hope I get around to, um, I had to squeeze it in the last session. We're going to have a little bit of a chat about question six, which I think is a good question um, because it is not too hard and not too easy. Um, yeah, so that's the plan. Um, so um, starting off with question two, I'm going to switch to the visualizer so that I can write out the answers um, and so that you are less distracted um, by my messy kitchen as well. Okay, here we are. Ooh, yeah, nice and straight. Okay, so uh, same rules apply as last week and always with me, which is, you know, please feel free to chat to each other, ask a question in the chat, chat to me. Um, it can be um, about what we're discussing um, or it can just be something very, very general. If you want to say, 
Um, miss, you've got too enthusiastic and you need to move your paper up or um, you knocked the table and the visualizer is no longer in focus. What the hell are you doing? Please say all of those things to me in the chat. Um, I'm more than welcome to, but you're more than welcome to, and I'm happy to get that kind of feedback because if you say it, uh, you're going to be helping not just yourself, but lots of other people in the class as well, for sure. Okay, I've got one more person to let in. All right, so question two. Um, so the first part of question two, we were asked to look um, at this um, five number summary, uh, five number summary of the data. Um, and we should be able to do that moderately easily. So the five point, um, five number summary of the data was the maximum, the minimum, the median, um, and the 25th and the 75th percentile. So it, those are the five points that it contained. So I need to write out the minimum, um, Q hat 0.25. Now the reason why it's Q hat is because this is a sample from the distribution. So um, it's a sample property, so it's gonna have the little hat on it. Um, I was asked for the 50th percentile, which is equivalent to the median. And you don't have to take my word for that. You had to prove that that was the case in um, question seven. So again, it doesn't really matter if you've not had a chance to look through the whole sheet all of the way up to question seven in advance of this class. Um, once Sarah Lee's releases the solutions, um, you know, if you want to be 100% sure that the 50th percentile is always going to be the median, look at the solution there. Um, we were also asked for the 75th percentile and the maximum of the data. So I'm only going to do a couple of these and then I'm going to leave you for, with a minute or two to do the rest. So um, the minimum point of the data. Now this was really straightforward because Sarah Lise had been so kind as to order the data for us. So I didn't have to rummage through the data trying to find the smallest number. Um, I could just immediately um, write that down. Um, so that's 29.140. That's the first number in the first row of the ordered sample. The 25th percentile, now that's a little bit more complicated. Uh, the formula I was given for a particular percentile um, was Q hat P um, and then um, uh, X at RP, uh, sorry, at R um, plus um, or minus R. Um, no, I don't know. Um, X at R plus one minus X at R. Now, at first glance, this formula looks a bit like maddening. And, um, well, yeah, it, it just looks more complicated than it needs to be. So uh, for a given P, I can calculate my R using R equals P times N plus one. Now, I got quite a good question um, in the Tuesday class, which was, why do I have a plus one with the N here? And the intuitive reason for that is if you think about trying to find the median um, of, um, say, 20, um, 20 data points like we have in this question, um, if I just divide, divide 20 by 2, I would, be, I would be looking at the 10th data point. And the 10th data point is not the median because there's nine points to the left of it and 10 points to the right of it. So I need to move over a little bit. Um, so that's what the plus one is doing there is it's making sure that um, when I find the median that I'm getting to the right place. So it's like re intuitively, it's kind of like recentering our data a little bit. Um, so if I, if I wanna calculate um, the 25th percentile, just as the first case, um, I, I, the, the corresponding R uh, would be 0 0.25 um, times 21, um, which is 5.25, okay? So in this case, the um, integer part of, of R, um, this is a mess now. Um, There we go. It's right now. 
Um, anyway, so the integer part of R, um, R prime, um, is 5, and the remainder is 0 0.25. So um, in order to write down what the 25th percentile is, um, I need to take the, the fifth um, point on um, in the ordered sample, um, and I need to add, add on um, 0 0.25 times the difference between the sixth element and the fifth element. Now I need to be a little bit careful here that the 0 0.25 here, this is nothing to do with the fact that I'm looking for the 25th percentile. Um, it's to do with uh, the value that I calculated for R here. Um, so just be careful with that when you're calculating uh, the other percentiles. Um, and if I plug in the numbers uh, from the sample, I can count along um, the fifth element is 36.571. Um, and the sixth element um, is 38. So um, I'll just write that out, it's 38.417. Um, and if I crunch all of those numbers out, I'm gonna end up with my 25th percentile being at 37.0325. Okay. So I want to just give you guys um, a minute or so at this stage. I'm going to go for literally just two minutes um, to double check your answers for the median and the 25th percentile and the maximum. So um, using what we've just discussed. So with what we've just talked about, you should be able to do the other quartiles for yourself. And I want to just give you an opportunity to just practice that or check your answers. Um, if you've already got answered question two. Okay, so hopefully you've had a little bit of a chance to look at that. Um, I realise I'm racing on, um, but um, I'm doing that because it didn't fit in as much as I would have hoped in the previous hour. Um, don't worry um, if you can't do both of those calculations in 30 seconds or so that I've given you, um, you know, especially if you didn't get a chance to look at the exercise sheet before this tutorial. Um, it's fine if these things take you a little while um, and if you need to put them into your calculator a couple of times just to make sure that you definitely got the right number. And the same definitely applies for part B. Um, Sara Lees has asked us to only use our calculator, not computer, for this exercise sheet. And I really struggle with this. Um, so, you know, when it comes to like 20 data points and having to add them up, you can almost guarantee that one of them I'm going to put in not quite right. Um, it's one of the reasons why I really disliked doing the exams. Um, so you know, if, don't worry if you're like me and you have to do these things two or three times just to check that you've not made a mistake with punching the numbers in in the wrong order too quickly, not thinking about it clearly enough. Um, so we needed the sample mean. And we know that this, the formula for the sample mean is one divided by 20 because there's 20 elements in this particular sample. And then I need to add up um, all of the elements in my sample um, that Sarah Lees has given me this one. And I really hope that if you do this, you get 40.6942. In fact, I know you do because I double checked it with the computer just to be on the safe side. Um, okay, so uh, one of you's asked me to explain the 0 0.25 again um, in um, the um, um, 
25th percentile here. And all I really wanted to say is that this 0 0.25, it's a coincidence that it's the same as um, the percentile that we're looking for. Um, in general, it won't be. Um, so it's just a coincidence based on the size of the sample that we've got um, that it was 2 point, um, 0 0.25. Um, it is the, the, the bit, the difference between the integer part of R and R, so R minus the integer part of R, so it's, it's this bit here that, um, on R um, after the decimal point. It's a coincidence that it's the same as the 25th percentile that we're looking for, okay? Fantastic. Um, so coming back to um, my sample variance, I've got my formula that I have to add up all of the x's um, and divide by 20. Checked it with the computer, feel confident. For the standard deviation, um, it's the standard deviation of a sample um, and therefore I'm gonna use one, a factor one over 19. And that's because I'd like a um, unbiased estimator um, for, um, the variance of the distribution overall. Um, so I'd like to use um, uh, n minus one. Um, okay, and the formula I'm going to use is I'm going to use the one that says um, that I add up the square of the x size um, and then subtract off n, uh, so 20 times x bar. And the reason why I'm going to use this one is, again, it's to do with my hatred of the calculator, um, is I've already calculated x bar, I can feel confident that I know what x bar is, and I only have to put x bar in once. Um, I don't have to take each individual number, um, subtract off x bar, square it, make a little record of that one, and then add them all up. Um, that's the type of thing that, you know, my personal nightmares are made out of. So that's why I'm using this formula. Feel free to use either form, whichever you feel most comfortable with. Um, and again, you'll get a number out there. Um, so with part C, we were asked to draw a histogram. Um, and the first thing I do with this question is I'm gonna um, write myself out a table. Um, I'm gonna specify what the intervals are that I'm in interested in. Um, um, I'm going to um, enter on under the frequency, so the number of times um, um, or the number of elements in that interval um, from my data, um, and then the height of the density um, histogram uh, in the final column. Okay. So I've been asked to take um, intervals um, that are five long, uh, starting from 25. And I'm gonna write this, these intervals out. Um, I've decided to take them open on the left-hand side and closed on the right-hand side. Now that's just convention. Somebody asked me on Tuesday morning, um, like, you know, so why are they open on the left and closed on the right? Um, and it, it is a good question. Um, I, it doesn't really matter, but I just need to be consistent and I just need to keep them the same. It's this, this is the way around that we do it by convention. Um, so um, in particular, one of the reasons for, for keeping them like that is to make sure that if I've got a data point, which is exactly 30, that I know which of these two, in, um, uh, two intervals it goes in uh, and I don't accidentally double count some of the points because I put them in, in, two, in two intervals because um, you know they overlap very, very slightly. Okay. So at this point, I'm really benefiting from the fact that Sara Lee's ordered the sample for me. It's very kind of him. Um, uh, because the, with the frequency, I can just count across and just look across each row of the data and count how many elements are in that range. If they were not sorted, I'd probably need a tally here, uh, you know, to keep track of what I was doing. Um, so, um, you'll notice from the data that there's one data point between 25 and 30, um, and there's two data points between 30 and 35, um, and there's five data points between 35 and 40. Now, if you continue down, 
counting up how many are in each interval. Um, you shouldn't have a total, which is the same as the number of total points in, um, in your sample. So the total should be 20. Um, and if you don't get a, a total of 20 when you add up those frequencies, that can be a really good indicator that you've accidentally double counted something or that you've missed a point off. Um, and especially if you happen to do a tally because it's, the data is unsorted, um, you know, you, you are going to want to add those up and just double check that you get to the right number. Um, now, the, the height of the density histogram, um, what I want to be doing here is I want to be rescaling the data um, so that the area under each of the bars on the histogram is going to be equal to one in total um, because they're probabilities. That's sort of what one of the properties we like about probabilities. Now, each of these bars are um, a five across. I've got 20 data points in total. So if I didn't rescale these frequencies at all, the area under my bars would be 20 times five, which is 100. Um, so I need to rescale by dividing by 100. Okay, so um, a rescale by 100 because uh, the sample size n times um, the width of the bars is equal to 100. So that's why I'm dividing by 100 there. Okay, so um, I'm going to just show you my histogram um, that um, I drew in my own time uh, rather than drawing it out, mainly because I can't really draw too well um, you know, under time pressure or with lots of people watching for some reason. Um, so there's my histogram. Um, you can see with the dotted paper that that's made it easier for me to draw. Um, I've got my table there. And because I've got one point between 25 and 30, the histogram is going up one over 100. And the same here, two over 100, because we've got two points between um, 30 and 35, etc. Okay. So hopefully you got something pretty much like that. Now the next question uh, we were asked, do we think this data looks symmetric? So there's a number of different things that we've calculated so far that we could maybe use to decide whether the data is symmetric. Um, and we're gonna wanna look at all of them. So one possibility is um, if the data was symmetric, the distance between the median and the 25th percentile should be roughly equal to the median and the 25th percentile because we'd expect the same amount of data points on either side of the median. Um, and the same is true if we took the difference between say the 10th percentile and the median and the 90th percentile in the median, we'd expect the data to just be relatively evenly spread around the median. Um, so the first criteria we might wanna look at is the difference between um, 75th percentile and the median. Um, and we'd want this to be approximately the same as um, the median minus the 25th percentile. Um, the second property we'd look at is we'd wanna look at whether the median and the mean are roughly the same. And again, we'd like if, if if the data was symmetric, we'd expect these to be roughly the same. Um, if the, the data is not symmetric and um, around the median, a lot of the data is say clustered to one side, and then there's a long tail on the other side. The elements in that long tail are going to increase the num increase the value of the mean, um, which. Um, is going to mean that the median and the mean differ quite substantially. Um, I can think of loads of data sets where that, where that would just naturally be the case. For example, you know, adult income um, in the UK, I believe that the median is really remarkably low, um, but then the mean is like substantially above the median in that case. And, and it's just because there's a lot of people with very low income. Um, and a few, few millionaires who are sort of like making the mean look much better. Um, Okay, so, and then the third thing we might want to look at is we might want to look at that histogram again. Um, so visually look at the histogram. Okay, 
Okay. Now, if when I visually looked at my histogram, I had all of my data like clustered on the far left and then tailing down towards the right, I would be like, yeah, no, that is not symmetric. Um, sometimes, though, visually looking at the histogram um, doesn't give us the full picture. Um, and I actually think it might lead us astray in this particular case. So if we take another look at the histogram, you can say, um, you might look at this um, and, and say, yep, symmetric data, love it. Um, or you might be tempted to say, because there's you know this one data point over here that makes it slightly heavier on, on the left-hand side. Oh no, this, this data is slightly kind of, you know, there's slightly more data on, on the left-hand side. It, 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 it's not symmetric. Well, the, it's actually remarkably close. And, um, you know, because, because we've got that sort of bell shape, um, you know, to the data, and we, we can't really say just by visual inspection whether we think it's symmetric or not. We want to be looking at those other factors as well, you know, just to be on the safe side. And if you look at all of the information that you've got, hopefully you were drawing the conclusion that, yeah, this is symmetric data. Um, don't worry if you came to another conclusion. Uh, you know, I, I, I think it's like, you know, you can't say for sure um, one way or another. Well, you can, but, you know, it, it, it could be reasonably argued that it's, it's not perfectly symmetric. Okay. So here's where I wanted to um, leave you a little bit more time, um, space to, to do something. Now, question five, um, we were asked to draw um, a box and whisker plot. Um, and I'd like you to try and draw a box and whisker plot with the data in this question. And the reason why I want you to do that is because I know that you've not tried to do it in advance because it's not a question that was on the sheet. Um, and, and it's nice just to have a little practice, um, you know, with just another, an, another question during this time. So give that a go. Um, I'm going to give you five, ten minutes or so, OK? Um, somewhere in the middle, um, maybe seven, yeah, um, to draw, on, draw a block, box and whisker plot with this data. Um, we've got enough information to find out what an estimate for the interquartile range is. Um, and then from that, you can find out the threshold for the outliers. Um, which is the um, 25th percentile uh, minus 1.5 times the interquartile range um, and um, on the positive side similarly. Okay um, and then from those you should be able to tell me first of all whether there are any outliers um, and what the upper and lower adjacent are. Um, and then all of that information should give you enough al alongside the five point summary from part A, a to draw yourself a box and whisker plot for this question. Um, so. Draw yourself a box and whisker plot with the, uh, with the data for question two. And I'm going to give you a solid extra five minutes. I realize I've been chatting about how to do it for at least a minute, um, but I'm going to give you at least an extra five minutes to give that a crack. Um, I'd like to kind of give you two things at once there. So I'm going to see if I can kind of fold this page up. Um, yeah. So I wanted to give you both the Summary statistics part A, and then this kind of sketch of what we want to do um, for the box and whisker plot at the same time. Um, so crack on. Uh, feel free to talk to me, feel free to talk to each other, um, or just work on your own.
Okay, so I hope you've had a little bit of a chance to, to look at that. Um, so, um, I just want to show you basically what I did rather than write it out. So I've used the um, 75th percentile and the 25th percentile to find the interquartile range. Um, I found the fresh thresholds for the outliers just using my calculator. Um, and I can safely say that there aren't any um, outliers. And the reason for this is, is because this threshold here for the lower, the lower threshold for the outliers is smaller than the smallest data point in the sample. And this one here for the, for the upper bound is also bigger than the biggest point in the sample. So um, in this particular case, because there's no outliers, the lower adjacent and the upper adjacent are exactly the same as the minimum and the maximum points of the data. Um, and those are gonna go at the ends of the whiskers of my box and whisker plot. Um, and then I can just use um, the other three points of the uh, five, um, five number summary um, to, to draw the box in there because the line through the middle of the box should be really going with the median um, and the um, uh, 25th percentile and the 75th percentile should be at the ends of the box. Um, now, my diagram's not amazingly neat, which is why I've labelled on the numbers for you because, um, you know, um, it's difficult to draw a line at zero point, um, at, you know, zero point three two five. You know, I think my line is actually thicker than that. Uh, but you should have, hopefully, you've got something um, like that there. Um, now, I didn't give you an awful lot of time for that, and I think, um, you know, realistically, if you were asked to do something like that in, in an exam, you'd be given a little bit more time, you know, so that. You know, you don't have to hurry. Um, so having gone through one example of drawing a box and whisker plot and about the five um, summary statistics, I would just like you just to take another couple of minutes just to look at your answer to question five um, and um, just check if you want to change anything um, in the answer that you, you, that you gave or that you looked at before. Um, uh, before this tutorial and I'm going to hang up on whoever that is because that's a bit unreasonable. Okay. So, um, yeah, just a couple of minutes. Um, just and question five, review your answer. Okay, so in a class, it's one of the other lecturers, he should know better. Um, okay, um, so review your answer to question five um, and um, uh, see if you want to make any changes in light of what we've discussed for question three. Um, Okay, so I'll just take, I'll just give you like maybe one or two minutes to do that and then I'll show you the box and whisker plot that I came up with um, for question five. I think I'm going to get another interruption as well from the sounds of it and it might be for the baby's milk, so please excuse me if we do.
Okay, so hopefully you've had another little look at that again. Um, and I would just like to show you um, the final result that I got. Um, so in this case, I did find some outliers. I found that the smallest two elements there were, were well outside um, the threshold um, for outli outliers on the lower side. Um, I actually found that the lower bound there uh, was 43, um, around well, 43 point something, but I don't extend the whisker um, of the box and whisker diagram all of the way to that lower bound. Um, I, it, it, it only actually goes to the, the smallest point, which is bigger than that lower bound, which is why I'm stopping at 63 there, because the third point of the data um, is 63. Um, and is kind of inside, um, um, it, um, inside there. Um, and the same on the upper end as well is when I found the, um, the, the threshold for outliers at the upper end, it was actually more than 100. So there was no possibility of getting any outliers on the, on the top end, but I don't extend the whisker all of the way to 113. Um, I just take it to the, to the largest value in the sample there, which is um, 90. Four. Um, and the three um, lines here, here, here and here, are the 25th, uh, the median and the 75th percentile respectively, uh, which I should have been able to calculate um, in the first part of the question. So there I am. Okay, so I've got five minutes left. So hopefully that's a little bit more than I did in the previous class to look at question six. Um, and um, in the first part of question six, um, I was asked, right, what is the CDF of, um, of a normal distribution? Um, so the first part, um, I needed to write out um, a reason why f of x um, should take the form of psi x minus mu divided by um, sigma um, if capital X is uh, normally distributed with mean mu and um, standard deviation sigma. Okay. Um, and that's kind of fairly standard. I'd hope that you would be able to do the first part there. Uh, the second part of the question, um, we needed to uh, find what the interquartile range for the normal distribution is. Um, and in order to do that, the first thing I needed was a formula for um, the 25th and the 75th. Uh, quarter, uh, percentile, and I'm actually just going to come up with a formula, a general formula uh, for the percentiles of the normal distribution. So what I do is, let's say little q is equal to um, qp. Uh, now this lead um, and qp, uh, we know this is the inverse of the CDF, so it's the inverse function of f um, applied to p. Okay. Now, Using um, the fact that we know that we've got this form to f, what I can write is um, if I'm taking f of q, um, then I'm going to have um, f of the inverse of p, um, f and apply to the inverse function of f of p. Um, Um, so I should end up with P because these two cancel each other out. It's like doing F and then doing, so doing the inverse of F and then doing F is always going to lead me back, um, you know, where, um, um, back to the beginning. So at this stage, what I've got is I've got psi um, of uh, Q minus mu divided by sigma um, is equal to P. And then, uh, and then hopefully I can rearrange this. Um, so with this step here, what I'm saying is I know the form of f from part a. Um, okay. And then rearrange um, to make q the subject. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to want to do is I'm going to want to apply the inverse of the function psi to both sides, um, you know, just to sort of get rid of that from the left hand side. 
Um, and then I'm going to want to multiply by sigma, subtract off mu, and it's going to leave me with um, GP. Uh, equals um, P plus sigma and then the inverse of psi applied to P. Okay, that's one. Um, so because of this, when I'm looking at um, the interquartile range of the normal distribution, um, I need uh, this is equal to the difference between um, the 75th percentile um, and the 25th percentile. Now, why don't I have little hats here? The reason why I've not got little hats anywhere through this question is because um, uh, we're looking at the um, percentiles of the, uh, of, the, of the actual distribution, not of um, a sample that's been taken, so no hats. Um, and we know that um, we've got this particular form for the percentiles in the normal case. Um, now, because I'm taking a difference, the mu's are gonna cancel um, and I'm gonna be left with sigma times um, the inverse of psi uh, applied to 0 0.75 and the same here with 0 0.25 and I can look up these two values in my normal distribution tables everything's fine and that's going to give us um, uh, 1.349 sigma um, like we um, like it was proposed now, the third part of the question has asked us to um, find, um, find out what our estimate for the interquartile range would be um, from the data. Um, so if I'm estimating the interquartile range, assuming the normal distribution from the data, what I would be using is I would be using this formula, but I would be using an estimate for the standard deviation. We know that our unbiased estimator for the standard deviation is S. Okay, um, and if you calculate what the standard deviation is, which you definitely should have done um, in part um, in question five, um, you're gonna be able to plug that in um, and you're gonna get your estimate for um, the interquartile range um, from the normal dis distribution. Um, if, this, if these data points come from a normal distribution it would be 23.3. Um, but the actual um, interquartile range of the data, um, so the, the actual interquartile range of the data um, we found in question five um, to be 17.5. Um, so what we can sort of see immediately here is that if the, if the data was normally distributed um, with the standard deviation that we've observed in this data, the data would be much more spread out than we've actually observed. We, you know, it would it would have fatter tails than it um, um, than what we've seen here. Um, but but when we look at the uh, interquartile range of the observable data, things are more kind of bunched together, um, which should be giving us an indication that. Um, the data is not likely to be coming from a normal distribution for question five. Um, and I think that's why I sort of found uh, question six interesting because um, it was sort of leading us towards the sort of point of being able to say, um, how, likely, how likely is it that this data, um, this sample that we've got comes from a particular distribution? Um, and in this particular case, we can, um, you know, use one of the properties that we can find from our sample to say, well, this is not the kind of interquartile range that we'd be expecting if, if the data was normally distributed. And therefore, we can, can conclude that it's unlikely that it's normal. Okay. Um, if you'd like to see in a little bit more detail what's going on there, I would say please definitely do review Sarah solutions once they're released and they might have been released earlier on today. Um, and if you've got any questions about what's in there, feel free to ask either Sarah or myself about it um, or just bring it up at the next tutorial in, in, in the chat via direct message. I'm more than happy to try and help you then as well. Um, so. I'm going to hang around maybe for five minutes, uh, just in case anybody's got any questions they want to type um, directly to myself or they want to turn the mic on. Uh, otherwise, 
feel free to leave um, and well done for hanging in there. Um, it's quite late on a Thursday afternoon for be think for thinking about maths. So, you know, I'm really quite impressed that we still get over 30 participants for this class. So thank you for attending. Squeaky chair. Yeah, I see. Um, bye to anybody who's still here. Okay, I'm gonna go now. I'm gonna try and find out what that other lecturer was calling me on in the middle of my class. Um, have a nice fortnight and I'll see you five o'clock in two weeks time. Thanks, bye-bye.